glad to um, introduce to do to you uh, Rina uh, Lapidus from Israel, and uh, she presents us uh, one uh, very interesting um, topic. It's okay. It's a little bit okay. Uh, the model of the ideal communist in Bulgarian and Russian cinema. Okay, and uh, before Thank we start you. our lecture, hello, good morning. Before we start our lecture, I would like to let you know that I'm editing a volume uh, in English uh, about Jewish Bulgarian uh, cultural and social relationship, and you're kindly invited to submit your, your articles. And here I put my visiting cards, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm collecting actually now the um, papers in order to be published in English or in England. Um, I, I, I believe so in England. Uh, maybe also in the United States. I have a huge experience in publishing things in the United States and in England. I have published a few books there in both countries. So you're kindly invited. And now we are going. To, we're coming to our lecture. The, uh, do you hear me? Okay. We're coming to our lecture, the uh, model of an ideal communist in Bulgarian and uh, Russian cinema. After 1946, when Bulgaria was, uh, uh, when Bulgaria joined uh, the communist bloc, um, there was felt um, a need to, uh, Bulgaria was compelled to adjust to the Soviet uh, line of ideology. And it was probably the lesser price uh, that uh, Bulgaria could have paid, because if, uh, we saw in 1939, uh, Finland didn't want to compel, uh, didn't want to conform with uh, Soviet ideolo ideological line, and as a result, uh, the Soviets invaded Finland. So Bulgarians, uh, in the, as we can see in Bulgarian cinema. Uh, uh, there was paid a, a lesser price, a lesser sacrifice by inserting some ideological uh, communist ideas in Bulgarian cinema. Uh, what was going on at this period in the 1920s and 19, till the la, la, end of 1930s in the Soviet Union, uh, uh, cinema was used as a means of propaganda. Uh, especially in, as, presenti, as a means of presenting a um, model of an ideal communist. An ideal communist uh, uh, was a man, a young Strayford man, who worked uh, very hard for the sake of the Soviet motherland and who sac uh, sacrificed everything for the sake, uh, the sake of the Soviet uh, rule. Uh, but uh, it didn't speak, uh, it didn't, uh, the common Soviet people couldn't accept this message. So this message was put in a kind of romantic message. Uh, young women who were looking for a husband didn't pick up young, um, handsome men, but only men who uh, knew how to work hard, who sacrificed themselves, and not necessarily a very successful man, and not a rich man, and not educated man. And um, many times uh, the show was very um, clear, and especially it was shown that a Soviet woman would prefer a man who knows how to operate a heavy machinery in, in the agriculture. We can see that, uh, for, uh, for example, there was a movie, Tractorists, when a man uh, can't operate a tractor and no women would pay attention on him. <coughs> and he feels like, uh, God forbid, a man who can't uh, manage uh, his uh, way with women. But as soon as he can operate the tractor, everything changes. And all the women are uh, standing in line for him and they reject uh, other men who are handsome, um, fat, or whatsoever. Uh, it was... Uh, kind of primitive message, of course, but yet it spoke to the romantic uh, feelings of common uh, Soviet folks. 
in the West it was Maserati. Ah, discussion I, after yes, that. Yes, I know <laughs> that. I, in the West, I, I, when I give a lecture about the West, I will give you another. Uh, um, I'm very critical, you know. In the West, you, in the West, you can't find uh, a positive hero. A positive hero is only white, tall, and handsome, and and not bold. You know, <laughs> not bold. Yeah, not bold with a few, uh, a lot of care. You know, you can't find the Chinese or black positive hero. All the Japan, all the Asian people are only jumping and uh, no, no romantic feelings with uh, romantic uh, with Chinese people. So I have a lot of criticism. Um, okay, so now we are coming back, and uh, kind of same message was. Uh, Conveyed also in the um, Bulgarian cinema. I would, um, I, I have to squeeze myself uh, into the 15 minutes of the lecture, so I will uh, speak um, briefly. The first movie I would like to relate to is a movie. Uh, it happened in the street, made in 1955. The plot is very simple. Misho, a young um, uh, driver of a heavy truck meets Katerina, a beautiful woman, um, uh, who is uh, courted by a different men. She is very young, uh, she is very handsome. And uh, they, she has also another man who courts her, uh, but she rejects, at the end of the movie, she rejects his advances because he's too, too educated, a real communist doesn't have to be too much educated. He is too educated, he, he's older than Misho, he, he engaged in sedentary work inside, uh, indoors. Mishu is working outdoors with a heavy truck, and he contributes uh, to, uh, to his work contributes to the uh, public in large. Uh, and he, he has no um, complicated thoughts and not, my, uh, not uh, very complicated. He is not a very complicated personality. At the end, uh, Katerina is uh, convinced that he is the man who can uh, bring her happiness as a woman and beget her with healthy children. And but the second man, who is uh, too, he she thinks that he is too weak and too educated, uh, can't uh, can't bring your happiness as a woman and can't build with her a happy, strong socialist family. So she prefers the young one. Um, uh, also, not only, but also probably mainly due to his knowledge how to operate heavy machinery. And now, um, well, I would like to address another movie, a um, movie called, uh, entitled Fav Favorite uh, na um, 13, which was uh, made in uh, 1958. This situation of uh, con conforming with the Soviet uh, ideological line changed uh, as soon as Soviets eased the restrictions and uh, they um, started appearing in the Bulgarian movies more criticism and more bitterness toward the Soviet regime and now we will, uh, after Favorite, we will um, approach also, also this topic. Uh, in Favorite 13, uh, there are two twin identical uh, brothers, Radoslav and Radosvet. Radoslav is a um, young and happy football uh, player, very straightforward uh, and honest, and Radosvet is the opposite. He is a reckless gambler. He is a reckless gambler and uh, just uh, an honest person and uh, a negative uh, figure. Um, uh, um, Rado Svet meets a beautiful girl, um, Yelena, on a beach in Varna, and he uh, falls in love, but Yelena comes from Sofia, so she has to leave for home to the capital city, and uh, Rado Svet uh, loses her. He is uh, determined to go to Sofia and just to walk around the wander around the street and to look for her. In the meantime, uh, four, uh, four uh, soccer teams um, are um, uh, searching for, um, are, are interested in signing a contract with Radoslav uh, in order to, to, to invite him to play in, the, in their team. 
So they send um, an agent to Varna, where, where he lives, unknowingly that he is now in Sofia. And in Varna, um, uh, the agent meets, meets rather Sved, the negative hero, by mistake. And he believes that he is rather slow. Uh, Rado Svet is happy to pretend to be Rado Svet, and he signs the contract instead of his brother, and he's invited to Sofia to play uh, in a football team. And he goes to Sofia, and now both the brothers are in Sofia, and Yelena by chance meets uh, Rado Svet, and, but he's, um, he's very rude, and uh, he, had, uh, he courts her very, very in an unpleasant way, so she slaps him and is angry with him and doesn't want to speak to him anymore. Uh, and she, she's not uh, aware that uh, he is rather sweat and not rather slav. In a few minutes, he, she meets uh, the, the real rather slav. <coughs> well, she's, uh, she's still angry, but uh, he, uh, he manages to convince her that there was a mistake, that he is the, the real rather slav. And Rado Svet is a negative hero. Both of them, uh, Rado Slav and Yelena, go, go to see the uh, game. And of course, the team in which um, Rado Svet is playing loses the game because of Rado Svet, because of his uh, uh, bad game. Um, so Rado Svet gains nothing uh, out of his uh, fear, but only shame and uh, disgrace. And, all, and the team and the public at large, and Yelena, of course, the first and foremost, uh, recognize the real rather threat, and everyone is happy, and the uh, agent uh, <coughs> uh, proposes um, a very nice contract to real rather threat, rather slav, pardon, uh, rather slav, uh, uh, suggesting him a high salary and an apartment in Sofia, and all the uh, all the best uh, material um, advantages of being uh, such a wonderful soccer player. But what do we think to, to us? No, the real Radosvet would reject this offer because of his high communist values as a loyalty to his uh, hometown team in Varna, uh, his rejection of material uh, benefits and he, uh, he is an honest man, he wants to, to remain loyal to himself, true to himself, and uh, true to the friendship with he, uh, with, uh, which he has with uh, his hometown team, uh, members of his hometown team. And he, of course, reje rejects such a, a proposal. And it is not only that he leaves back to Varna, but he al also Convinced, convinces Elena to live with him. So both of them, even Elena, as, um, um, who, who lived in uh, Sofia, lives for Varna because she evaluates so much um, the high moral principles of her beloved one, uh, the one who, who is willing to sacrifice himself for the sake of the uh, advancing public public at large, uh, his hometown uh, town of Varna, and uh, contributing to the Soviet, uh, pardon, uh, communist society in, in Bulgaria. But this situation changed, uh, as I have said, in 1967, when it was a certain easing in the communist restrictions in the Soviet Union due to the um, uh, rule of uh, Nikita Khrushchev. And there was uh, made another movie, uh, Deviation. It was a very, very painful movie. Uh, uh, on their way to Sofia, Boyan and Nida meet, it, uh, meet it, uh, each other by chance. He is a very successful engineer, and she is an archaeologist. And now uh, they haven't seen each other for 20 years. And now he, uh, he recalls that 20 years ago they had an affair, love affair, very romantic, tender, a bountiful uh, love affair. But uh, Boyan uh, decided to leave um, Nida because he was uh, brainwashed by the uh, communist uh, by the communist party. 
uh, of Bulga uh, by, uh, by the organization of the communist youth in Bulgaria, the Komsomol. And uh, he recalls how he was attending a meeting of the party and he was uh, demanded by the party activists to sacrifice everything, he, everything, his life, his personal interests for the sake of building real communism in, 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 in Bulgaria. And now he is full of sorrow and regret because now he is married and so is also Nida is married and they can't betray their spouses. And their um, beautiful romantic love of 20 years ago is gone and there is no way to bring her back. And uh, the movie is built in uh, two levels. His uh, sor uh, sorrow for uh, Nida and his anger towards the brainwashing of the Communist Party, um, uh, of the Youth Communist Party in Bulgaria. But this uh, period of easing, uh, easing uh, the um, communist restrictions in the Soviet Union was ended up very soon uh, when the Soviets invaded uh, Czechoslovakia in 1968. And uh, after this period, uh, no, no movies expressing criticism towards uh, uh, communist um, uh, rule uh, were um, actually accepted. And uh, no, no more critical movies were made. So that was the connection between the Russian and uh, the Bulgarian cinema. And uh, as we can see, Russians, Russians are not always uh, good for advance, advancing Bulgarian culture. Thank you, thank you, Rina. And uh, you're just in time. Thank you for that. I'm right at home. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would invite Marianne Tutui from uh, Bucharest, from the Opresco Institute of Art History, to um, talk about genres about melodrama in the Balkans. Dobar dobar dan. Uh, prijatno mi je da bude pak se s vas uh, um, tozi pot ste govorio na angliski. Uh, it is about uh, a well adapted genre, melodrama in the Balkans. Uh, melodrama represents at the same time a genre as well as an incipient stage of cinema, reflecting its humble origins of folk entertainment. In this respect, it requires charity as attitude and polarization, even stereotypy of characters as a composition principle. Therefore, it has been deprecatingly called a feminine genre or a tearjerker. Obviously, melodramas were uh, abundant in the Balkans until uh, Second World War, when existed even uh, specialized directors, such as Jean Mihail in, uh, in Romania, with Manasse in 1925, Lia in 1927, The Burden in 1928, or Ion Shakigian also in Romania with Duty and Sacrifice in 1925, about the uh, First World War, <coughs> Love Symphony in 1928, and Candles Are Lit in 1939. There is a Bulgarian uh, specialist, let's say, Boris Grezhov, with Maiden's Rock in 1922, or uh, Unmarked uh, Graves, uh, Beskresni Grobove in 1931. Then in Turkey, it's uh, Muksin Ertugrul, with A Love Tragedy in Istanbul, in 1922, uh, The Beggar of Istanbul, uh, 1931, which is in fact uh, a co-production between Turkey, Greece and Egypt. I'll talk about it later. Uh, then uh, the Greek Dimitris Gaziadis with Love and Waves, 1927, uh, the famous uh, Astero, 1929, or Achilleas Madras, also in Greece, with The Gypsy Woman of Athens, 1922. Jean Mihail, the Romanian Jean Mihail, shot a melodrama also after the Second World War, uh, The Devil's Ravine in 1956, 
while veteran Orestes Lascos made films up to his age of 64, so until 1971, making, the, making increasingly democrat, uh, melodramas such as Golfo in 1955 and The Mountain Girl, Sera Katsanica, in 1959. <clears throat> Duty and Sacrifice, it's a melodrama where World War I intervenes into a love triangle from a Romanian village. Ion and Ilie are in love with the same girl, Ilana. Ilana responds to Ion's love and the two lads will come to grips after Ion finds uh, his rival trying to kiss his sweetheart. The two lads go to war and they meet in the same regiment. It's a dramatic coincidence. Ion is wounded while Ilie, assuming that his rival is already dead, deserts in order to come back to his village but he gets killed while attempting to cross the barbed wire. Yon recovers from his injury, is awarded a military medal, returns home and marries Ilana. Maiden Rock, Maiden's Rock, um, Mominata Momina Scala, uh, although a silent film, uses an, ele an element of composition, an old guzzler, uh, fiddler, uh, who plays and sings the ballad mentioned in the title. Liliana, daughter of, uh, uh, of the village mayor, is in love with Stoyan, a poor shepherd, although she is promised to the son of the local Chorbagia, the local uh, landlord, rich man. After the <coughs> arrival of a gypsy camp, Stoyan, uh, Stoyan is lured by gypsy Gula and leaves the village with a caravan. Liliana, distressed and becoming a laughingstock, throws herself from a cliff and dies. Left by Gula, Stoyan comes back and remembers his former love. Liliana's ghost haunts him, so he will also throw himself from the cliff. Uh, Astero is the first Fustanella. Um, Fustanella. Oh, 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 oh. Does it work, this? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Fustanella, uh, it's a Greek term uh, for uh, that uh, skirt um, worn by men. And which is used in several Balkan countries, especially in Greece, and uh, it became uh, also a name for uh, for a, a, a melodrama uh, which is localized uh, in the village and sometimes in the past. So it, it, it's like uh, um, it's similar with uh, operetta with costumes, let's say. So. Astero is the first Fustanella successful both with the public and with the critics of this time. The critics said in Greece, this first film that satisfied us, it is a genuine and pure, it presses something from the Greek mountains, fresh air. The scriptwriter tried to give us a picture of life in the Greek countryside and though he didn't manage it completely, he, did, he does give us Greek mountains life with the naivety of the, its inhabitants and their customs. In a village of Peloponnese, the rich herdsman Mitros marries his adopted daughter with another breeder, although she and his own son Timius were in love with each other. Astero's husband gets killed. The head of the family noticed Timius suffering, decides to give his wealth to the young widow so that the two lovers uh, can marry. The success uh, encouraged the producer to make a, not, to make a sound uh, remake in 1944, and in 1959, Dimos, Dimos Dimopoulos made another uh, remake that became uh, the real, the, the real uh, most uh, successful Fustanella of all times in Greece. Melodrama has been localized also, uh, also uh, has been localized also in towns. Almost in all social backgrounds and tackles also more serious topics are, such as racial and religious prejudice implied, for instance, in the love between a woman and a Hebrew girl in Manasseh, or the one between a gypsy man and an American woman in Achilles Madras, the gypsy of Athens, or even the anti-Ottoman resistance of the clefts of the, let's say, Hajduks in Greece at the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th century. The preference for the past is uh, characteristic not only for the Greek melodramas, but also for the Bulgarian and Romanian ones. Sometimes, it's, uh, sometimes it proves 
useful to make the audience accept some incredible plots in an idolized rural milieu with fairy tales and op as with fairy tales and operettas. We can conclude that the first, first of all, melodrama is consubstantial to ruralism. It has survived in Greece and Turkey after Second World War and came, and came to a head in the 50s and the 60s. Thus, melodrama has become a, a derogative label for the entire Turkish cinema for many years. In the past few years, thanks to a series of domestically uh, produced hits and a number of smaller films that garner attention at international f uh, festivals, the words Turkish cinema has ceased to be an insult as uh, it, it has been the expression, uh, like a Turkish film, um, said uh, BJ Emiri, a uh, uh, tur Turkish specialist in melodrama. So uh, the, this expression, it in ends like a Turkish film, was very derogative that the Turks made fun of their film themselves. Uh, it is significant that the first films with sound in Turkey and Greece were melodramas. The Beggar of Istanbul, 1931, Turkey, Greece, Egypt, uh, directed by Muhsin El Trigrul, and The Wrong Road, Kakos Dromos, Fenayol, uh, 1933, Greece, Turkey, also by El Trigrul Muhsin, uh, from a Greek novel. It's interesting that even the relations between Turkey and Greece were very bad. Uh, the producer was American, and he didn't care. He simply realized that the, the closest uh, studio for sound was in Istanbul. So he took all the Greek uh, actors and they went to Istanbul. So um, uh, they made two co-productions uh, uh, without uh, taking into account the bad relations. So, and it is interesting that even after, only after 70 years, they made another co-production between Greece and Turkey. Uh, if you remember in the 60s, in the 70s, even in the 80s, uh, there was no contact between Greece and Turkey, uh, even in soccer, you know, in basketball, uh, even the two uh, countries were members of NATO between, uh, because of some islands and especially of Cyprus, if you remember. And only in the 90s, let's say, the relations became a bit more... Uh, uh, normal, but even today there are big problems. Um, then the, another film, The German Strike Again, in 1948 by Aleko Sakelario. So th th this is the, the first sound film after Second World War. Also, the first color films in uh, Greece and uh, in Turkey were also melodrama, Epidemic, in 1952 by Ali Arpar, respectively, the Lover of the Shepherdess, uh, in 1956, by Elias Paraskevas. Uh, we can conclude that melodrama reflected, on the one hand, the exodus from the villages to towns, and on the other hand, it has attempted to promote until the 60s, and even later, a certain traditionalist, predictable characters, a redeeming uh, denouement, as in fairy tales, uh, happy end, uh, and so on, expected by the uncultivated audience inclusively the urban one. That was almost a warranty for a box office success. Another explanation for the proliferation of such films in Turkey was the low production costs and the possibility to, to use the sets costume during the conditions of big production of the 60s. According to Barış Kilibay and Emin Onnani in Chiroklu, after the, imp the initial impact of Egyptian films, French literary melodramas of the 19th century and American melodramas, they helped shape the Turkish melodrama, and quickly the genre gained its local characteristics in the 1960s, uh, with an input of domestic literary sources. The two researchers identified three types of melodrama depending on the hero's capacity to overcome his social... Uh, oh boy. His social um, uh, um, class differences. Uh, so, uh, uh, it's a lot of things to, to say about this. I, I would like to, to skip some Just things and say two uh, important things. One is that, uh, in, uh, let's say, in uh, uh, Yugoslavia, Romania and Bulgaria, the melodrama had to disappear due to the pressure of social realism. All there is 
<coughs> one or two melodramas. Uh, while in uh, Greece and Turkey, uh, when it mingled uh, with Western and uh, uh, neorealism, uh, uh, it had to find a way to survive. Uh, so uh, it's interesting that after the 90s, uh, uh, there is again uh, some co-production, a very famous uh, melodrama, Borrowed Girl, Egreti Celin, 2005, a co-production between uh, Turkey and Greece. Uh, and uh, also very interesting is that uh, melodrama uh, flourished again in Serbia, uh, uh, also uh, due to some um, liter local literary sources. So uh, even if it sounds uh, 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 that we talk about um, uh, a genre from the past, it's not like that. Uh, it's uh, it still has roots and it has a, a future uh, in the Balkans. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> and now we show here to Mircea Deaca from the University of Bucharest, uh, and uh, he'll tell us what gives unity to a versatile cinematic approach, the films of Radu Jude. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your kind invitation and, uh, well, for you to attending here and to be here and to be uh, attentive. Okay. So I'll start by uh, clicking something. Aha, uh -huh. that's the one. So uh, cinema, it's a variety of images. I, I take uh, the first part from uh, Jacques Omo. He has in 2011 uh, an article about the history of cinema, which uh, can't be done. So the idea is that you can't do a history of cinema. And uh, then a little bit from uh, an article from Cassetti. Uh, so the, the idea would be that cinema is a variety of images and uh, you have a subjective uh, experience of a presence. So the images are presence, uh, they're not something else, and you have to interpret them in a subjective way. So where is cinema? Is cinema in this kind of object or is in the subjective way of coping with it? Then uh, there are some others uh, who are talking about the idea that the narrative is the conscious tip of the iceberg. That means that uh, when you understand the story, then uh, if you take two persons, they understand it differently. So where is uh, narration? Where is the story? Because there are, there's no congruent story between two uh, viewers, cinema viewers. So film for Cassetti, for example, is this first object, is a plurality of media channels and a plurality is mode of consumption. Um, so, for example, today uh, film was propaganda. Well, okay, but the film can be music, like MTV videos, it can be painting, animated painting, it can be melodrama, it can be empathy for the emphatic animal, which are humans. It can be in own art, it can be in commercial uh, action, family, bio journal, fantasy, and so on and so forth. So that, that's the idea for this first object, like film. Uh, if we take uh, the studies from uh, Tononi, for example, every experience, subjective experience is specific, unified, and particular. So you, you don't have general things. When you are conscious about something, it's very individual, very specific, and very a conscious experience is a unified and specific experience. Okay, so uh, author, director, uh, well, the style of an author, for example, it can be a verbally reported pattern reconstructed by the viewer based on goal concept, the context of use, and selected cues. That means that uh, if you want to see the film as a propaganda discourse, it's a propaganda discourse. If you want to see it as a as an animated painting, it's an animated painting. Okay, so the goal-based concept is what you want to do with it, with this uh, thing. Okay, so for other people like uh, Roger Audin, Laurent Julier, even Bordwell, um, film is a fuzzy concept. It means 
that uh, you can have the experience, you can have evaluating, you can have a usage of a film, interpretation, understanding, analysis, or description. Analysis we are doing today, description when you tell what's, what's the camera angle, interpretation <laughs> when you make uh, metaphors in philosophy, you know, what, something else. Usage, usage when I see a film and I would like to dress like uh, James Bond. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the way levels of analysis of a film. It can be prefigurative, that's the way I see things. That means uh, flow of continuous qualia. Figurative aspect, that means graphic composition, the edges, is, that's the presence more, more, more or less, that entities and events. Uh, symbolic, that means metaphor, narrative, what narrative schemas, and narrators, concept. Lizards. I can write it, but I can't, can't spell it. But it means narrators. Who is giving you the information, emotions, and discourse? So that's the level of analysis we can cope with films. Uh, about Radu Judah, he has several films. Each film is different from the previous one at several uh, levels. For example, a short from 2006. Um, it's a miserable condition of Romanian post-communist society. Uh, that's from Dominic Nasta, uh, I took uh, the description, a minimalist mise-en-scene, spontaneous understa understated acting from the actors, playing both the father and the son, and dialogue based on black humor, sophisticated camera work, and sound design, refusing any additional music. That's a description of this film. This is uh, some excerpts from the film. Long take, camera follow-up, movement, quite classical in a way. Uh, medium shot and long shot, mostly, most of the time, uh, we see here, and characters are inside the frame, a frame in the, in, inside the frame. Alexandra, okay, that's a slice of, uh, slice of life, short, ironically portraying the problems of a divorced couple confronted with the identity puzzle set by their own four-year-old daughter. So it's a different, here, um, people are coping with a, uh, the problem of the television set in Alexander with the girl. The happiest girl in the world, 2009. The story of a young professional girl who has won a car in a commercial campaign and she goes to Bucharest for a film. Okay. Uh, here we have medium shot and extreme long shots, staging in depth, impending obstacles uh, in front of the main uh, point of attention. For example, here we have the characters who are setting the um, commercial and the main character which is uh, behind them. But it's also a classical framing. Characters are inside the frame and uh, medium and extreme long shots are used. And, um, and those impending obstacles which are constantly uh, deframing a little bit the uh, uh, main point of interest. A film for friends, which is very interesting. Uh, a man records himself leaving a video message. It's a short one, one hour, I think. Uh, short of one hour, okay. Uh, leaving a video message to his loved ones, and after this message, with tackles in funny and sad ways, it's from my MDB. In funny, sad ways, a lot of issues, both personal and social. He shoots himself in the head. But fails, and what follows is the ridiculous and horrific Johnny one single shot. It's a film of one single shot, which takes out the main features of the minimalist uh, Romanian film. Okay, uh, for example, no music, no scaling, lack of establishing shot, uh, no spectatorial engagement. That means uh, no empathy. Uh, Post-event camera indexing, where the camera is uh, displaced. Uh, uh, in front of the action. Okay, avoidance of the continuity still, the Hollywood like, long shots, uh, no rapid pace of editing, tableau vivant, frame composition, and scopic obstacles. And um, uh, the film of Radu Jude, uh, which is uh, a film for friends, which is a message for friends, but in a way it's a message for his fellow uh, directors. It's a message from one director to another. It's a minimalist parody. It's a reductor of absurdum of minimalist stereotypes. Anti-hero alone, the framed character, framed in the double sense, being in the frame and framed by someone else, cramped framing, fragmented body, long take, 
auto referential artifact of the film about the film, the gaze at the camera insisted because uh, Edmund Gio and uh, Puyo used the uh, gaze at the camera in order to show its meta film, uh, the medical stuff in uh, the characters and so on and so forth. But the main idea is that all of a sudden Jude makes a kind of paradical use of uh, minimalist techniques and stereotypes. Medium shot, medium long shot, staging in depth, square framing. That's the character. It's a steel camera uh, and it's, uh, if we read it in a metaphorical way, it's a director who shoots himself in the head because uh, Jude is making fun of the, uh, the other directors, Christy Puyo and uh, Christian Mungio. They are shooting in the head, doing bad films, which are long takes, and uh, <laughs> just uh, accusing everyone. And the character is uh, like uh, Lazarescu, uh, taken care by the medical staff uh, after an agony. He is fragmented, he is lying, and he is an anti hero, which is taken out by. The end is also interesting. Uh, the camera is framing the disappearance of the character uh, outside, and we hear just the noises of the outside world and some objects without any meaning, significance. Platonuman in familias, everybody in our family, dysfunctional families, more or less. Extreme, this time it's extreme and close shots. Mobile shaky camera, bad framing, no establishing shot, and uh, framing that all, all the time cuts the the, uh, the body of the, the character. Okay, fragmented bodies. Um, Aferim, 19th century Valachia, which is a kind of a western, and we hear, we hear the choice of the um, of the frame. The choice of the landscape, the extreme long shot, the wide setting, the staging in depth, uh, the soft tracking movements of the camera, also Hollywood-like, also Western-like. It's another exercise, in a way, in another uh, kind of style. Scott Hart, 2016. That's uh, a writer in a sanatorium who will die in a Proustian manner because he is ill. Okay. So, spending his last moments, 10 years in fact, in a, in a hospital. But here we have a still camera, central perspective in a square frame. This is the central perspective, a Renaissance like, I think, point of uh, mm -hmm. reference in the middle of the frame. And um, the repetition of composition, it's a kind of a steel a tableau vivant repeated uh, like this one. Oh, sorry, this one. And the medium shots also of lying bodies or lesson of anatomy position of the main character, which is uh, not here. Well, the compositions are made for uh, tableau vivant, for, for pictures, for photographs, okay? like, uh, like this one, very classical composition, extremely classical composition. It's the father looking at his uh, Jesus Christ uh, son, uh, <laughs> ill, and his bed. And we see framings like uh, Mantena, we see fr framings like Rembrandt, that's the anatomy of the, um, of the body, lesson of anatomy, or here, I forgot, uh, to what is, doesn't matter, it's going to be in a copy, written copy. And I don't know from which artist this composition is taken, the father, the yellow, the victim, the mother, and uh, this kind of setting. I think it's a painting, but I, my mind is not artificial intelligence, so I can't find it in so Google Images. So, yes, one minute. Two minutes. <laughs> um, bits of pieces of minimalist films, intertextuality, actor transfer. Okay, this would be uh, the pattern of his style. Diagnostic images, that what what remains. Violence and death, epilogue commemoration, probably. Reuse of old wheels, springs, and pulleys for new machines. Each time Jude does this. So no groundbreaking innovation of all the time exercise. There is no author in the end. Okay, so no author and no history of authors. Of, uh, what is a style? Is something individual or is something a collective concept? Uh, is style history of fuzzy pattern of tractors? 
is family resemblance categories, is general topics for discussion for us, is uh, folk concepts like styles, like schools, like cinemas, which are scientifically not very well explained in all cases. Uh, can we make a history? As Omar says, Omar says we don't because there is no causal explanation. We can do the history. The main idea is uh, showing from Radu Jude and his dispersed movies that each time there is no style of Radu Jude. He's changing. We, we take formal uh, uh, features, we'll see the changing. Long shots, close shots. We are taking the content, the story, the, um, the drama, it changes also. So we, do we have several directors or one? Do we have one director because we put a label on it? Probably because we put a label on it. That's mm -hmm. my point of view. But even if we can't do history, even if we have a lot of crises described, starting from one director to several directors, uh, we still can't deny the reality and significance of films. And I will add here, uh, it keeps us discussing ideas. So it keeps an institution like this one alive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. And now we're going to listen to Alexander Donev, uh, who will present us some um, external and internal models uh, for contemporary Bulgarian independent film. Good morning. I'm starting right now. Uh, so, I suppose it would be compelling for everyone to know which particular films created in a concrete production situation correspond, correspond more to the spirit of the times and reflect more deeply and adequately the moods of society. Whether these are the films created in the setting of state funding or are rather the spontaneously made independent works financed outside that system. As a first step to finding an answer of this question, I will point out some of the most successful Bulgarian independent films created after the year 2000. <laughs> By successful, I mean films that have provoked a considerable national and international response. The most Prominent examples are Miller from Mars, Eastern Place, The Lesson, or the movies that have attracted audience near or above the limit of 100,000 admissions in Bulgarian cinemas, like Operation, Schmenti Capelli, Living Legends, Attraction. Here my hypothesis is that these concrete examples cannot help us to formulate a universal recipe, but analyses might show us some of the underlying logic and offer us a more general model under which these films achieve their performance with the public or critics. Tracing the interaction between the newly created films and the models that have influenced them would allow us to go beneath the surface of the independent productions we are analyzing. Identifying the lines of influence enables us to delineate the impact of the force fields of different traditions and characterize from an additional viewpoint the style and specific features of the certain independent movie makers. Miller from Mars was the first independent production to reveal the potential of such films to become an essential, essential element of modern Bulgarian film culture. Its plot is organized around the theme of escape from the, sea, from the city to the village, from civilization to nature. This, this was a recurrent theme in a series of Bulgarian films from the 1990s, The Devil's Tale, 
a letter from America visited by God. These films, including Mila from Mars, in fact reverses the direction of movement characterizing the migration cycle in Bulgarian cinema of the 1970s. And in a certain way, it comments on the transformations that took place in society after 1989. On the other hand, in Mila from Mars, the movement in the rural world is not simply a journey or purposeful search for the roots, but an escape. Completely different is also the meaning of the specific magical atmosphere of the village. It's largely due to the marijuana that the old people still living there not only grow, but also consume. No matter how backward their living conditions are, they prove to be active participants in a modern division of labor. It seems to me that the plot structure of escape from the city to a strange village inhabited by eccentric villagers is not overly influenced by 1990s cinema. The model followed here seems rather to be a film made in the late 70s by the artistic advisor of Zornica Sofia. I mean, the film Illusion, directed by Ludmil Steik. Similar of the villagers in the film, those in Mila from Mars have created an impression in which conservative and modern are mixed and which serves them perfectly well in explaining the hostile and baffling world. Pressured by the brutal laws of a wild market economy that has destroyed their idyllic lives, the peasants <coughs> aim to survive and easily become passive witnesses in a world of brutal injustice. Their collaboration with the world of crime is a chilling parody of the conformism and panic in face of mafia-permitted society. The construction of the film in terms of vision, plot and acting is an eclectic and eccentric combination of seeming incompatible styles and devices but it functions as a surprising organic unity in this collage-like structure. In a film review for Variety, the main female character is described as an underage hooker introduced in a fair far, fake far vest and miniskirt like an extreme version of Judy Foster in Taxi Driver. At the same time, the props and Miller's silent performance as she hides in the village refer to Kate Pascalevo's young character in The God's Horn. The plot of Miller from Mars is obviously built around the stereotypical perception of Eastern Europe in the first years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. They seem to mirror the standardized perspective of a foreign viewer, but also a kind of self exoticization intuitively developed by Bulgarian cinema. As for the plot, Eastern Place is composed of two parallel lines of action that intersect at several points. These are the winding stories of two brothers. Curiously, while Christo's story is built on biographical elements from the actual life of the artist who is forced to work in a furniture factory, the story of Ovanes' character is clearly inspired by another film. We see interwoven here a series of themes from one of the famous French movies of the mid-90s, Mathieu Kasowitz's La Haine. From this film depicting life in the poor French capital suburbs, the Bulgarian director was influenced for the uncomfortable view of prefabricated residential complexes in Sofia, which generate despair, hatred, and violence. Rejected by society and finding themselves at a dead end, young men join in gangs that wreak havoc not only at football stadiums, but also as fighting groups for anti-Gypsy political parties. Eastern Place is 
perhaps the only truly contemporary Bulgarian film of the first decade of the new century, whose action takes place in the big city. Most other films set in the present time interpret it either through plots unfolding in a prov provincial backwater or indefinite historical time in which the issues from the late socialism are mixed with the antagonisms typical for the 90s. Precisely this combination of social sensitivity and authenticity characteristic for Eastern Plains is inspired by a large extent by Lehen. It advances even more, it enhances even more the documentary psychological quality of Christo Christo's character and story. A similar combination between the documentary approach and social analysis largely marks the plot of the lesson. Internationally, the highest acclaimed Bulgarian film in the last 30 years, with 83% approval of the critics and 23 international reviews in the Rotten Tomatoes website. Chicago readers movie critic Ben Sachs finds in the lesson some of the noir intonations of James M. King enriched with social realism in the style of the Darden brothers. Many foreign reviewers stress the skillfully built thriller atmosphere in the lesson, where suspense is generated not so much by the crime plot as by the sinister social context. The directors Grozeva and Valchanov are lucky that their independent production premiered only a few months after the film The Darden Brothers, Two Days and One Night, starring Marion Cotillard. The proximity of the appearance in time was, has offered to film critics a convenient context for recognizing the similarity in theme and style of these two films made at the opposite ends of Europe, but inspired by the same economic crisis. In briefly touching upon the most successful mainstream independent productions, I must emphasize that in underlying each of them is some common plot, motive, or genre. The sketchy structure of Operation Schmenti Capelli is based on the theme of the double doppelganger. Likewise present in Bulgarian films ranging from the comedy favorite 13, starring the Postal Karamite, to the double, starring Todor Korov. In Operation Schmenti Capelli, the doubling of characters follows a Chaplinesque approach, conveying a social dimension as it juxtaposed the homely jobless Seko Seko and the gangster politician with the name that is hard to pronounce. The identity of the double character suggests the, international, the intentional blindness with which the cards are dealt under the new system, predetermining the place of each person in the new social hierarchy. In Living Legends, the common structural motive is the main character's amnesia. He must go back to the time in his adolescence the time before he entered the adult world of social play and compromises, accepted for the sake of career. How common this motive is, you can see at the list of 50 popular films based on the theme on, of amnesia and impairment of memory at the IMDb website. <laughs> In attraction, the plot model is the exploitation genre of frivolous college films, typical for American independent cinema. Everything here largely relies on the conventions of a genre that presents an imaginary world of extremes in which good and evil are grotesquely exaggerated. But in this mixture of magic and reality, shaped according to the fairy tale rules, very distinctly stand out the characters, emotions, values, and life strategies that define the real world 
of the film's audience. The viewers are moved more by the preconditions than by the outcome of the situation, by the conflict themselves, than by how these conflicts are revealed. The audience is familiar with the rules of the, of the genre in, and is confident in the happy ending. But the clashes along the way mark the important events in any person's life at the borderline between childhood and adulthood. Here, some preliminary conclusions. It is evident that the independent cinema, whether it is art house oriented or dominated by mainstream attitude, seeks and achieves better contact with the audience. This is especially typical for Bulgarian cinema for the first decade of the 21st century. Part of the complexity is that in cinema, especially in low budget independent filmmaking, striving for commercial success, the formulas and patterns are so mixed that they are difficult to discern. Coming back to the title of this paper, I can define the external models as formulas and the internal ones as patterns. Formulas are intentional. They are applied from the outside outset of creation to achieve a planned result. Patterns, on the other hand, are spontaneous. Our world is filled with nat naturally occurring patterns found in everything from geology to social trends. There is nothing magical about these patterns. They simply exist because multiple separate instances react in the same ways to similar factors of environment. To a significant extent, the success of independent cinema is due to its directness. Important part of it is the aspiration to expose this environment in much greater fullness and to make it recognizable and powerful to the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. And now we have the other reader from uh, the Institute of uh, Art Studies, another Alexander, Alexander Staikov. Please come. And uh, he will change the language. <laughs> so the book. Uh, Bu uh, Bulgarian language is one of the official languages of our conference, so uh, he will uh, tell us something about the thematic orbits of the Bulgarian motion pictures in the last few years. Thematic orbits in the Bulgarian film and film in the last few years. Случващото се в българското игрално кино окончателно затвърди усещането за повишен творчески интензитет, за сериозно раздвижване в динамиката на теми, похвати и естетически концепции. Настоящия текст се обръща към тази тенденция, чрез опита си да постави акцент върху тематичния анализ, да открои подбудите в творческите търсения, които дефинират посоките на авторите. Въпросната тема е интересна по няколко причини. На първо място интерес представлява питането с какво е населено интерпретативното поле на активните ни кинотворци, какви са хоризонтите и трепетите, които ги насочват към едно или друго тематично пространство, какви са морфологичните специфики на техните избори. Поради ред причини ми се струва логично да започна тематичния преглед именно с сага на режисьора Милко Лазаров, оператор Калуян Божилов. Далеч съм от идеята, че глобалния универсализъм следва да е водеща посока за бъдещето на игралното ни кино, но появата на Ага преодоля един класически и станал банален с годините аргумент. А именно този, че българското кино е прекалено локално, че езиковата бариера го обрича единствено и само на вътрешна консумация, при това на един забележително малък като мащаб пазар, че неговите теми са пределно национално обагрени за зрителите по света. Действието е пренесено в далечния север, сред бълтата на суполярна Якутия, цветовата неутралност на безкрайното бяло неутрализира и културната рамка на ситуацията във филма. Мащабът е библейски, семейството на Нанук и Седна е всяко едно семейство на планетата. Филмът използва универсално послание към всички човеци за разпада на семейството, за последното семейство, видяно през безкрайно увеличената оптика на абсолютната универсалност. Както казва в едно свое интервю Милко Лазаров, когато семейството се разпада, целият свят се разпада. 
При него българската публика не разполага нито с езиково, нито с културно, нито с рецептивно предимство. Появата на Ага носи в себе си няколко ключови за съвременното българско кино извода. На първо място говори за наличие на необходимата зрялост и натрупвания, които да позволят надскачане на локалния културен субстрат. И не на пост роман на Милен Русков, написан на автентичен за времето диалект. Историята се върти около една самоволна акция, извършена от хора със съмнителна репутация, която съвременната ни историческа наука определя като катастрофа за революционното движение. Семантичната структура на повествованието, автентичният диалект, воденето от първо лице са елементи, които превръщат екранизацията му в сериозно предизвикателство. Тънкият баланс случай се състои в запазване на духа му от една страна и адекватна филмова адаптация от друга. Това бе и предварително обявената от авторите цел да направят комуникативен филм за масовата българска публика, без извънредни претенции за висока художествена стойност. Безспорно възвишение страда от някои дефекти в драматургичен план, както и от пренаселване с популярни актьорски лица, което обаче подпомогна маркетинговата му промоция. Специално внимание заслужава операторската работа на Антон Бакарски, успял да превърне прекрасната българска природа в отделен пенсонаж на филма. Без претенции завеличава фестивална съдба, възвишение беше необходим за публиката и тя го доказа. Говоряки за тематични орбити на новото ни игрално кино, една се откроява като акцент именно тази на социалната драма. Ако веднага след промените на преден план бяха тежките криминални случаи на публични разстрели, мутренски побоища, усещане за съобщ страх и несигурност, то настъпването на новото хилядолетие в сериозна степен това се оталожи. Под повърхността на членството ни в Европейския съюз и формално демократичната държава останаха тежките казуси за повсеместната мизерия, отсъствие на справедливост, болезна на липса на морал и съчувствие. Тази трансформация бе адекватно уловена от кинематографистите и през този период организираната престъпност отстъпи своето място като главно действащо лице на обикновения човек, захвърлен да оцелява насред емоционална и ценност на пустиня. В фокус се превърна неговата ежедневна борба, тежките избори, трудното намиране на изход и сложните и многопластови рефлексии в душата му. Това даде възможност на автори стъна кусък към задълбоченото вникване в човешката психика да разгърнат таланта си в пълна степен. Като значим пример в тази посока в по-ново време ще спомена филмите на Милко Лазаров от Чуждение от 2013-та и урок на Кристина Грозева и Петър Вълчанов от 2014-та. Те са симптоматични в това отношение и вестовалните им успехи показаха, че социалната драма ще бъде водеща тема и в бъдеще. Причината за трайното и присъствие през последните години в игралното ни кино не е само изчерпаемия материал, който предоставя нашата действителност. От продукционна гледна точка разходите за нейното създаване са далеч по-приемливи. Киностилистиката е камерна и минималистична, персонажите са ограничени до няколко, обикновено не са необходими множество локации и снима се задължително в натура, няма допълнителни разходи за наймане на масовка, техника и специфичен декор. Затова драматургично поле специалните ефекти са табу. Ето го предимството, което създава възможност за дебют на млади и не до там млади автори, както и за реализация на независими спрямо държавното финансиране проекти, като е случая с урок. През 2016 година излизат две заглавия в тази посока – Христо на режисьорите Григор Левтеров и Тодор Мацанов и Безбок на Ралица Петрова. Христо е безмилост на дисекция на живеенето на ръба на крайната безисходица и жесчасовото оцеляване на главния персоназ – чието име носи лентата. Крайно стеснение му време и хоризонт постепенно го превръща в подивяло животно, принудено да препуска към следващата спасителна сламка и осмисленето на работата като единственото, което има значение. Драматургичната линия е ясна и добре изведена, постигнат е максимален документализъм. Камерата на Ненад Бороевич е динамична, без ние на малко дистанционно съзерцание на действието. Филмът е заснет предимно от ръка, без притеснение от интензивното колатене. Ефектът от това е, че вкарва зрителя директно в действието, държи го максимално близо до главния герой. Търсенето на този резултат е ключов за цялостното отношение, което цели да постави Христо до нас, да ни убеди, че е един от нас, да съпреживеем тежката му съдба като част от нашето ежедневие. Именно в тази дилема се състои оценката, която бихме дали на самите себе си. Дали ще изпитаме емпатия или ще се дистанцираме с идеята, че това не ни засяга. Специално внимание заслужава изпълнението на млади актьор Димитър Николов в ролята на Христо, който успява да влезе в травматичната дълбочина на персонажа си. Ситуацията в Безбог вероятно е още по-мрачна. Тук криминалната линия е изведена на преден план. Човекът зад борда е медицинската сестра Гана, която се грижи за възрастни хора, като злоупотребява с личните им данни с цел осъществяване на данъчни измами. За разлика от Кристо, тя е намерила своята ниша на оцеляване и схвърлила е целия ненужен багаж от себе си като морал, ценности и хуманност. 
Впечатляващо е пълното и безразличие и дистантност. Режисьора Тралица Петрова по забележителен начин ни представя битието на оцеляващите кухи хора, превърнали се в сянка на човешко същество, въоръжени с оправданието, че средата е виновна за всичко. Изключително попадение се оказва изборът на Ирена Иванова за главната роля. Въпреки, че филмът бива обвинен в преднамереност, той успява в опита си да представи съвестта като Ахилесова пета в безчовечната ситуация на безмислие и безнадежност. Кинематографичната стилистика и тук се движи в установените за жанра принципи. Оператор е Курма Редригес, който с доказания си професионализъм е в пълен синхрон с атмосферата. Едри планове, които превъщат зрителя в своя род и следовател на душевната пустиня в личността на Гана. Тук няма идея за симпатии към нея, а поглед върху разпада на човешкото. И в този момент Ралица Петрова ни вкарва в елипсата на пробуждането на моралния катарзис, които костват най-високата цена за героинята на Ирена Павлова – нейният живот. Следващото заглавие, което остави следа е посоки на режисьора Стефан Командаров от 2017 година. Удачно вплетени 6 истории на таксиметрови шофьори и на фона на нощна София. Филмът много удачно влиза в дирията, оставена от разгледаните до момента негови предшественици. Съществената разлика тук е по-отворената аналитична бленда, която за разлика от урок Христо и без Бог не разглежда единична съдба, а се опитва да търси по-широки обобщения за българското общество. Тук няма главен персонаж, калейдоскопичната структура на сценария ни завърта през 6 различни съдби, всяко от които носи различна диагноза, различно отношение за заобикалящото ни. Таксито е особен тип пространство от смислова гледна точка. То е обезличен автомобил, публично урбанизирано място, в което посоката не задава управляващия го, а някой друг. От кинематографична позиция всяко много тясно пространство, каквото е това на купето, е предизвикателство. Именно с него се справя чудесно оператор Веселин Христов. В тази ситуация едрите планове са основна част от визуалната конструкция на филма. Това допринася допълнително за влушението, за вношението на притиснатост, на стестеност на героите от тежките моменти, които преживяват. Действието се развива в рамките на 24 часа, 6 истории така паралелно, което придава автентична динамика на сюжетната линия. Обща драматургична, драматургична нишка са радията в 6 таксита. Това споява историите в един разказ за размитите посоки в големия град. Отделно внимание следва да се обърне на прекрасното портретиране на Нощна София, което разбира се среща и други филми, но при Командаре е целенасочено търсен акцент. През настоящата 2019 година линията на официалната драма Българско кино отново е сериозно представена. Внимание заслужава три филма. И Ирина, режисьорски дебют на Надежда Косева, Лошо момиче, режисьорски дебют на актора Мариан Валев и Прасето на Драгомир Шолев. Ирина е впечатляваща тежка социална драма, която няма как да не ви напомни за урок на Грозева и Вълчано. И тук главният персонаж е вкопчила се в отчаяна битка за оцеляване жена и майка и тук мъжката половина от семейството е слабото звено и тук основният проблем е остър недостиг на пари. Разликата е в драматургичния подход, ако при Грозева и Вълчанов в началото е винаги постно от събитийна гледна точка, изглежда тромаво, то при Надежда Косева е точно обратното. Още в първата третина на филма зрителят буквално бива залят от травматични събития, които правят атмосферата прекалено мрачна. Финал. Ето финал, финал. Добре. Добре, ето финал с последния. Значи, лошо момиче и прасето ги прескачам. Последното заглавие, на което ще обърна внимание, е снимка с юки на режисьора Лачезара Врамов в настоящата година. Фабулата стъпва на кратък разказ на Мирослав Пенков от сборника му на изток от Запада. Тематично филмът е труден за улавяне, по-скоро влиза в кожата на психологическа драма, стъпваща върху криминален елемент. Нагазва в философски и религиозни води, опитвайки се да даде своя версия за екзистенцията изобщо. Множеството реминисценции от антропологическо, културно, етническо естество превръща снимка в Юки в нещо нетипично за българското кино. Ангажирането на японска актриса, универсалните вношения на историята, по-скоро го доближават до Ага и в този ред на мисли предричам силно представяне зад граница. Авторите заслужават адмирации, защото са успели от тежък и сложен материал да направят добре структуриран филм, заснет по чудесен начин от Торстен Липшток. Идеята, че всеки един миг от живота ни съдържа в себе си потенциалът да е преломен, както всяка една клетка в тялото ни да се превърне в ракове, е разработвана в множество филми. Авторите на лентата предлагат своята стойност на версия, която допълва забележително тематичната палитра на новото ни кино. През последните три години българското кино е в прекрасна кондиция, показва го дори само големия брой филми, които са предмет на настоящия доклад. Всички те имат съответните претенции за добра художествена стойност, която според мен защитават успешно. Разбира се, извън разгледаните заглави има интересни и стойностни филми. 
Усещането е за стабилно развитие с нарастващ тем както в тематичното разнообразие, така и спрямо дебютите, но може би в най-голяма степен по отношение на художествената стойност. Дано да продължава така. Благодаря за вниманието. Okay, we started a little bit later, but uh, still we should have some uh, minutes for discussion. And where are our panelists? They ran away. <laughs> okay, Mircha and Rina. <laughs> okay. Or Faker. Yeah, so I have a. Um, uh, if you have questions to. Are there too many questions and uh, comments to this uh, presentation? But, uh, mm, she may be. Here. She's coming. Yeah, they're coming. Oh, they're okay. <laughs> well, um, but I have a question to Marian too. Uh, you said that the melodrama genre uh, in the communist times a little bit was reduced or something, but um, I know the Ingeborg's um, Bretov approach to this, and she said that uh, still um, in communist times uh, the melodrama is one of the leading genres. <laughs> Sorry. Favorite theme: How social realism, uh, social realism interacts with these uh, melodrama patterns um, in Bulgarian cinema, and I always ask me why why melodrama is the leading genre in Balkan cinema. Uh, what is your answer? Why? I, I, uh, I have to repeat myself. I said, I, 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 no, I said three, three, three uh, reasons. One, because it's, uh, it's, uh, melodrama is consumed, uh, it, it's, um, uh, it's typical for, uh, um, uh, the beginning of cinema. Then uh, it's about rural societies, the Balkan and, and uncultivated audience. And then uh, uh, in case of Turkey, for instance, is the influence of uh, French melodrama, uh, Egyptian films, uh, Iranian films lately. And, uh, and then there are, there are already patterns, uh, successful, uh, so they couldn't leave them out. It, 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 there are recipes for success, for easy success for uh, 
and yes, and not, and that's why I said uh, I stressed the first sound film in Greece and Turkey, the first film, color film in Greece and Turkey. Yes, when uh, this is not just coincidence, they were the most important genre in a certain time. Even Ilmaz Güney began with a kind of melodrama and then he surpassed the model and he uh, made fun of this. He, he succeeded, for instance, Ilmaz Güney was the first who could uh, make uh, in Turkey cinema very interesting uh, negative uh, roles. In Turkey it was not possible before that. You have to be beautiful and good-hearted. <laughs> uh, yes, but later on, uh, with, with his, he, they said about him, uh, Chirkis Kral, the, the ugly king. He was the first ugly, bad guy who uh, was haunting the audience. Uh, and, okay, uh, even there, the Western and the... Uh, and uh, neorealism um, uh, modified. I mean, I mean, the first films in Turkey and in Greece that got bigger words were still melodramas. Yeah, although uh, sometimes we forget to say this. I mean, it's about uh, um, uh, what was uh, uh, the dry summer. They never say it's melodrama, but it's in fact, it's a bit more modernized melodrama. Um, and also uh, Blood on the Land. Uh, um, uh, the critics and the, 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 the jury stressed what was new, that it looked like a, a Western, but also the Western has the scheme of melodrama. On the other hand, uh, and on the, other hand um, the, the scheme of uh, the, the, the laws of... There, there is a certain similarity between the scheme of uh, social uh, of communist realism of uh, socialist realism and melodrama they are not very different yes. <laughs> that's why yes okay i agree with this yes but i couldn't uh, i couldn't develop it here in in the written uh, version it will be more and i'll, yeah. I'll try to quote you to read the what you yeah. said about that i didn't have time yeah mariam mircha uh, has a question <laughs> no the, well actually it was a thought. The, the idea for me is melodrama uh, implies empathy, okay, the reactions of empathy. Yes, but empathy for film means presence of what I talked about. So it's a device of film. It's not a device of a genre, not a device specific to a period. It's not. It's it's film itself, meaning that. In order to get the immersion or the absorptions of the viewers, you need emotional uh, drives. So uh, when film doesn't want to be uh, experimental, okay, so to show itself as a device, they will absorb the viewer in this uh, fantasy illusion, which is film. So all film in this sense is melodramatic. <laughs> Another conclusion: <laughs> Any melodrama is a meta cinema. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I'm joking. <laughs> okay, uh, Ingeborg. And uh, now I have my questions to Lina or my remarks. Uh, thank you, Lina, for uh, your very interesting presentation. Um, in my book, uh, Bulgarian Cinema After World War Two, I have a big chapter about development of this communist character, but I never, never came to the idea that Radoslav from Ljubimac Trinajs could be an example from a deal communist. And, uh, this is a very um, interesting point of view, uh, even for me, because I worked on the issue for a long time, for 20 years. Um, and um, I would... Um, uh, I have some... some uh, some remarks to what you say. Um, I think that um, uh, this uh, so-called, I don't know how it's in English, Otipel, Otipel, uh, after, uh, after uh, melting, uh, this melting uh, in the 
Да, it started, uh, it started somehow in Bulgaria as early as uh, late 50s, not in the 60s. And uh, the movie uh, which was made in this uh, context uh, is uh, Life Flows Slowly By from uh, 1957. Of course, it was uh, after that it was arrested, put on the shelf, etc. But in this film, uh, there is a very well-educated, beautiful, fine, communist Jewish lady, Shelley, Rachel, Rachel. And um, it um, comes to some, uh, how to say, contradiction to what you say. They are uh, peasants or uh, uh, working class guys, etc. I don't know if you know the film, if you have seen the film, but it is worth to... <laughs> to see it, uh, and it's not only Shelley as a uh, representative of intelligentsia, but uh, um, other characters in this film uh, who present this ideal communist. Uh, of course, a lot of social criticism. The film came on screen in 88, but anyway, it was made 56. Uh, and then uh, I want to say not to, to, to retell my, my book, my colleagues know it. Uh, I want to say that it's very, it's uh, evolution or devolution or whatever, but uh, this uh, hero, this character change through the decades. And it's a very complicated uh, issue in Bulgarian cinema. How this ideal communist, the, the communist, the ideal communist, the representative of the so-called party line, uh, he changes or she changes. Um, there are female communists too. Uh, and uh, this is a long and very interesting process to be researched and surveyed and uh, commented on. Uh, and uh, I would say that um, this hero didn't disappear until, uh, after 1968. Uh, on the contrary, I don't know, I'm not an expert in Soviet cinema, but in Bulgarian cinema, um, this is the most interesting period uh, in uh, relation to the ideal communist after 68, after the break of the uh, Prague Spring. And it develops until uh, 88, I would say. Uh, that, that is what I wanted to say. Uh, As a matter of fact, I don't find any contradiction between what you said and what I said. No? No, no there is no contradiction. I just yeah. Uh, okay. You know, you know, uh, Radoslav, uh, Radoslav, uh, the movie of the Fabulous Sotin is a very nice romantic comedy. It's a great book, one of my favorites. <laughs> it is a very romantic, nice romantic comedy, and there is also a little bit of uh, uh, criticism of the uh, bureaucratic uh, saucer team manager, and the, the com communist message is um, um, conveyed in a very nice way. And it, we will never find it unless uh, his uh, unexpected decision to uh, to reject all the materialistic benefits. About the fact that there are also uh, communist uh, women, women, not only men, of course, there are also women and uh, Bulgarian women and Jewish women, whatever. But. It, uh, Bulgarian, Jewish, whatever Jewish, whatever Bulgarian. There are different kinds of uh, communists, but all of them are communists, and which is the most important. And uh, this is uh, the communist line that uh, you can be whatever skin you want, but you you have or nationality, but you have to be a communist. The fact that uh, uh, in Bulgarian cinema there was more criticism of um, Soviet approach after 50s and not only after 60s, that is correct, but uh, still there appeared also movies uh, 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 accordingly to the, according to the Soviet uh, 
ideological system. But uh, after uh, when it was uh, the rule of Nikita Khrushchev, it was much easier, and there are there are more movies. I don't find any contradiction between. The, I'm actually yeah. Actually, thank you for adding to my lecture, and uh, it um, could be a very nice lecture if you combine our efforts, you know. So, and. Um, yeah, yeah, but uh, the wall deals not with Russians and Bulgarians, but with Jews and Bulgarians. <laughs> ah, from from our country. Fine, I will be happy to submit my paper there, uh, because uh, last year I had a conference in Israel dealing with uh, Bulgarian and Jews. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, Marianne wanted to, uh, and uh, Alexander. Alexander. Mm -hmm. Alexander <laughs> Not so great. Uh, I have a question to Mircha and want to ask him uh, about this uh, transformation in the style and approach by Rado Jude. I know actually only his feature films, but it is easy to to follow this uh, process also based on, on his feature films. Uh, probably he, he didn't came to the, to the conclusions of, of his paper, but my question is quite direct. What is the explanation for this uh, transformations? Is this some part of, uh, how to say, strategy? Or... Uh, or some process of finding his own style. As strategy, I'm uh, understanding some type of, let's say, mimicry to the leading process in the national Romanian cinema. Because when, in the beginning, when he, he was following this minimalist style, and in the later period, he's becoming more more universal, more general as style, but also as topics and narratives. Thank you. I don't know. <laughs> the answer, I, I don't know because, well, uh, it's, a, it's a very good, it's a good question. Uh, why this choice of not being, uh, let's say, coherent in a way? Is it a strategy or is it uh, searching for its own style? I think, um, well, as a character, Jude probably is polemic. He's doing polemics. With uh, this short film, he is uh, uh, just positioning himself towards the others. Okay, so he negates. Provocateur, yes. That's that's uh, this way. And his last film, which is a documentary, is also a provocateur uh, regarding uh, Romanian myths and uh, history, the grand history of Romania. And then he he tries to show the other face of uh, of reality, or at least his reality, and to interest the the viewer by this way. So his strategy is to change in order to get uh, interest in, on himself and he is provocateur to get the interest. Otherwise, if you ask the, uh, the director of, uh, about his intention, I never did the history of intentions of authors. I had the experience with Federico Fellini. He always lied in his interviews. <laughs> it's typical of uh, Fellini. And others try to be truth to, to their own uh, ego and uh, ideas. But in fact, we can read films in, in many ways, independent of whatever they think. They just let the object uh, live its own life. So, I don't know, maybe we can gather up uh, elements of a strategy, of a kind of a intention, but not of the author of the works in themselves, which try to get uh, higher interest from the, the viewers by making some provocative uh, assumptions, acts, uh, statements, uh, either formal or content-like. Uh, content and maybe that's how we can just get a common pattern. Thank you. Um. Yeah. Um, I would like to add something to uh, what Mircha said. It's 
for instance, the last film was made real a scandal. Uh, uh, yes, they said, both uh, uh, critics and filmmakers said, oh, Jude, you are giving us lectures already. So, uh, but in fact, the, the problem is that he's not, he's provocative, but on the other hand, he's a bit, let's say, modest. For instance, in, uh, in the film about the gypsy, Mm -hmm. In Aferim, uh, they, they reproach him a lot of things. But in fact, it, it, it's a collage of many quotations uh, which were suggested by historians and, uh, and uh, uh, literary specialists. So what is very provocative there is not him, from him. And he took it from others. And also, in, in the end, he quotes that. He's... Modest. He didn't say I said that, but there are stupid people who, even critics, <laughs> who didn't uh, watch carefully uh, the film and the, the credits, and they said, "Oh, how can he dare to say that?" But it was really it, this is a quotation from a real guy from 18 or 19th century. Second, I remember the reverse when two Romanian uh, critics, women. Um, who are theoretically more uh, keen to uh, fashion, said, oh, marvelous costumes, typical Romanian. <laughs> but they were, as you know, they were made by a Bulgarian woman. So uh, they, they proved that they are unaware of the topic, but they know they do a lot of blah, blah. Romanian it's Balkan. Uh, <laughs> it, it, okay, in Romania we say that Sarma is Romanian, but uh, there is Sarma from Ljubljana from, to Tashkent. Uh, so uh, it's not Romanian. Uh. <laughs> there, there is a, a study made by uh, Barbara Laborde from Paris 3. Uh, she is dealing with reception of movies. And the study was about uh, French comedy. It's a white uh, bourgeois uh, family, French family. They have three daughters or four daughters. Each one marries a Chinese, a black guy, a Jew, and uh, I don't know, uh, uh, some, <laughs> one of them probably, exactly. And there's a lot of dialogues, a lot of uh, quiproquos, and it's a vaudeville. Okay, but she studied the, um, the reviews. So 100 reviews, okay? And it's half and half. Half said it's, uh, it's a conservative way of uh, encouraging male bourgeois uh, attitude. And the other said, no, it's the other way around. So the reaction of the public, everyone was interested, but half said it's conservative, half it's, uh, said it's revolutionary, and it defends the views of the uh, infringed people and so on. So, um, in a sense, as you said, the reactions of the public, when you do something which is a little bit provocative, then you will be sure that you will have half and half of, of the reactions. But you will have a reaction. You will have the reviews. <laughs> Um, I just something okay. short. I want to and thank uh, you to thank uh, to uh, to you and uh, also to the to Bulgarians. I I, I really uh, found out some new things uh, from the films of the 50s, 60s in Bulgaria. I I, I, I watched only Geracite, uh, <laughs> so I I was not uh, unaware of these gems. Uh, and you gave me an idea, which will be a, a very interesting and funny paper to make a, 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 a broader study, let's say, in Albania and in, uh, in Yugoslavia, the communist was ex, uh, very often ex-partisan who becomes a teacher. In Albania, all communists are teachers. The teacher, okay. And second, there is another funny thing. What is the figure of the communist in capitalistic films? For remember, a, a film from 1942 in Romania, it's very funny how the, commun uh, the or uh, in uh, Billy Wilder, what is the communist look? So I'll, I'll try to make a, uh, thank you, you gave me a very uh, good idea. Uh, wants to. It's not a chance, it's not a chance that, it's not a chance that all the communists become teachers. 
because in Latin America, uh, Latin American countries, you know, the Soviets used to invite the priests to study in the uh, Soviet Union, and when they came back to Latin America, they preached that Jesus Christ was the first communist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly, because he gave up all his uh, um, material benefits and he was only addressing poor people. So that's why the Americans were so angry with the Latin American uh, Catholic priests, uh, because they were, were preaching for, for Jesus Christ, who was, of course, the biggest uh, communist, as they were taught in... Uh, in Soviet Russia, you can realize how much hypo uh, hypocritical were Soviets when they presented, uh, uh, so uh, instead of atheism, they presented Jesus Christ as uh, the first and the biggest communist. Okay, last. Which is called Cinematic Cold War. Uh, and there is, um, this is a big study about uh, how uh, communists look in the Western movies and how Western spies look in communist movies. It would be funny, really. I think. Yeah, I, I will bring tomorrow the book and show it to you. Yes, yes, sure. I think, um, I think uh, it will be interesting to... Uh, yeah. You know, my uh, better name is uh, what you, you 